Hi, everybody. Let me see. Oops. Okay, I'll wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, I think that is uh, 14, halfway there, wait a little longer. Okay, let's start. So we're talking about deep learning. And when it really comes down to it, it's, it's, it's basically we have, we're thinking of, we have some function y equals some function of weights which are a bunch of parameters and X is input and F is a deep network. Um, which I mean, this, we can think of it as a bunch of, bunch of units and they're connected and then there's the nonlinearity. And by having lots of layers, you can have really complicated functions. Okay. Okay. So, so um, in fact, incredibly complicated functions. You can do um, object recognition, which is which is a really nonlinear transformation of input to output. I mean, typically, we're going to consider the case of supervised learning. I'll talk about unsupervised learning a little bit later, but in supervised learning. Um, we have training examples, x mu, y mu, u equals one to p, training examples. Okay. And typically, this is sort of the strange things about, strange thing about deep networks. So n equals number of neurons. Is greater than is greater than p. So you have more adjustable parameters than data points. Something they told you to avoid in classical statistics, uh, but they work. But that works well in, in deep networks. So. As by way of review, I want to do two things. I want to first of all show you, you know, why why this is okay. And greater than p. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, regime I talked about last time called the NTK neural tension kernel regime in which weights don't change very much. And what I want to convince you first is that that's a relevant region, regime for the brain. Okay, why can you have so many parameters? And, and we'll just, you can actually see this in linear, reg linear regression. So I did this last time, but I did it way too fast. Okay, suppose we, we're trying to fit a model. So, so linear model, linear regression is y equals w dot x. 
equals the sum i equals one to n of w i x i. Okay. Now suppose that so x can live in you know x could be x in principle could live in n dimensions, but suppose x lives in two x lives in one d. X lives in one dimension. And what that means is that X mu are training examples. Again, we have training examples X mu, Y mu. So X mu equals some alpha mu times some direction X zero, okay? So this basically means in some you know, high dimensional space, there's a vector x zero and all our data points live along this, this vector, okay? Our data points really sit in this line. So what does that mean? That means that our, our basically, when we fit, fit our parameters, fit our, um, our training examples, we have y mu, equals W W dot X mu is just alpha mu X zero equals alpha mu W dot X zero. Okay. So when we find the weights, so, you know, the, the weight doesn't really matter. So all we're looking for, um, trying to find, oops, find is the value of w dot x naught, okay? So all we care about really is the component of the weight so the weight is, you know, the weight itself can be, can point any direction, right? So the, the weight might be here, oops. So this might be our weight, but all we care about is the component along X zero. So this is W dot X zero, really all we care about, okay? And so our data in some sense, if we plot our data, our data looks like we have in this axis, we can have alpha mu, and y mu, and this is all that matters, right? It's gonna be some, trying to fit some, fit some model through this and the slope equals w dot x dot. So because our data lives in one, one dimension, we really only have to find one parameter. Um, and so that's really, really easy, right? So even though n may be a million, if a, with a handful of training examples, we can figure out what that slope is, okay? So over-parameterization doesn't matter if the data lives in low dimensions, and we can even take, you know, just to be clear about this, we can go one higher dimension. Let's say um, X lives in 2D. So that means X mu equals alpha mu one, X one plus alpha mu two, X two, so we want to fit y mu equals um, w dot alpha mu one, x one plus alpha mu two, x two equals um, w dot x one, alpha mu one, plus w dot x two, alpha mu two. And so we really now only need to find two parameters. Okay, so sorry, it's really if if data lives in if data lives in two D, then um, then it's two D linear regression, even though dimensionality may be huge. Okay, so we have the situation where we're overparameterized; we have more parameters than we need, and that's okay if the data doesn't live in really high dimensions. 
And it's actually worth looking at what happens when the data does live in high D. So let's say, this is the last thing I'm talking about, X um, lives in the full, lives in the full n-dimensional space. Okay. Okay, we're gonna do gradient descents. Which means, actually this is, I'm gonna actually go to, Next page, so I don't run out of room. Um, so X lives in full in dimensional space. And what that really means is X equals it's some vector X1, X2, Xn. And all the components are, let's say, all the components are independent. Are independent. And have, let's say, have unit variance. So X can point in any direction you want, okay? Our loss as usual is gonna be one half the sum on mu of Y mu minus w dot x mu squared. And so when you take a gradient, delta w equals minus eta partial of L respect to w, um, that equals minus eta the sum on mu of w dot x mu minus y mu times x mu, okay? And what that means is that w if, if W is initially zero, so if W at T, you know, T equals zero, equals zero, that implies W equals, after you optimize, um, is gonna live in sum on mu of A mu X mu, okay? All gradients point in a linear combination of the X mu's, so W can only live in X mu, okay? Mu, um, equals one to P. Okay, so that's what happens when we show, um, and we're gonna call this WP. And let's say that we got those weights perfectly, which is sort of the best case scenario, but W star, the true weight matrix equals WP plus um, some other direction, which we call W perp, okay? And this is p-dimensional. And this is n minus p-dimensional. Okay. So because we only have p training examples, we can only pin the weights down in this, this, this space. And so if we write, um, if we have a new examples, w star or w p, Training example so far, x mu plus one. Okay. Um, so this is y mu plus one, y hat mu plus one. Um, given what we've trained so far, we can only it can only be that. And this is equal to um, oops. So this is some WP is just W star minus w perp dot x u plus one. And w star that x perp is y u plus one star, the true, the true value minus w perp dot x u plus one, okay? And this quantity, this is n minus p dimensional, this can be big, right? In fact, if p is small, this is huge. And it's, complete, it's a completely random number right, um, relative to what it is. So, so, so it's, not only the, it's not only the case, so we have sort of two things. One is um, if, 
so the conclusion is, um, so P, so to train, train well, P must be greater than, than, than D effective. And this is the effective dimension of, effective dimensionality of the data. Okay. Um, actually, it doesn't even have to be much greater. It really just needs to be greater. It doesn't even have to be a huge amount greater, okay? Um, and so this, I've shown you this for linear regression, but I believe this is actually not 100% known, but I believe this. So this was true for linear regression. Linear regression. Uh, it may be true for, I would say it's probably true, true for deep networks. Um, this is actually not known. Okay. So deep networks, I mean, they're, they're very complicated functions, um, but all they are is very complicated functions. They still have to learn out. Okay. Okay, so that's important point number one. The second important point is that, um, so weights don't necessarily have to change much. in high dimensions. Okay. And that's important because, well, in high dimensions meaning when there are lots of weights. And the reason that's important is because in the brain there are lots of weights. Okay, so we're gonna show you that again for linear regression, suppose we do our usual model, y equals w dot x equals one, uh, sum i equals one to n of w i x i, okay? Um, and the x i, so x i is data. So x i is data. And this might be, for instance, um, for instance, it might be pixels. And so we say that xi um, is order one. So order one, which means independent of n. Okay, so if you have, if you know, you're building a model with, with a thousand pixels or a million pixels or a billion pixels, the pixel is just some range between, you know, zero, 256 or zero and one or whatever. So Xi, the value of Xi doesn't depend on, 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 um, on the weights. And so Y is also order one. Y also order one, you know, it can be a label, it can be some analog value. Um, it's, just, it's just sort of some number. It doesn't, also doesn't scale with it, okay? But WI has to go, let's say WI is initially random. So initially random. Okay. And that's um, something initially random. Um, so including random sign. And by initially random, what we really mean is um, uncorrelated with X. With 
Xi, okay? And this is something that, that I mentioned earlier, and it's one of the most important facts you guys should know. Um, so if it's random, the sum of the average value of the sum on I of W I X I random and zero mean. Okay. Equals the average value of sum on I. In fact, W and I and X I are independent. M equals zero, right? Because W I is zero mean. Oops. Okay, but remember the variance of this now is um, the average value of the sum on i of wi xi squared equals the sum on ij of wi wj xi xj. You get to average these things. If they're uncorrelated, this is equal to sum on i of wi squared okay um, which is equal to the n times the average value of w squared okay um, and so if n average value of w squared goes like order 1 w must go as 1 over root n okay so it's a sort of a, this is a super 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 important fact that comes up all the time okay it's something that you really need to know if you're going to do anything in high dimensions okay so what do we have so let's go to the next page we have y equals the sum on i, we're going to write w dot x, and w i goes as one over n. x i goes as order one. Okay, now I'm going to train on one example. So just x one, y one. Okay, so we y one, equals w dot x1. Um, so what the weight should be, we're gonna let w, so w equals initial weight w0 plus delta w. And so we have y1 equals w0 dot x1 plus delta w dot x1, um, which we can write as y1 minus w0 dot x1 equals delta w dot x1. So remember under gradient descent, so gradient descent, so delta w is proportional to x1. Right, so we're going to write delta w then is uh, delta w equals y one minus w zero dot x one times x one divided by x one dot x one. Um, so this this quantity here is delta w. Okay. And you just plug this in, right? So delta w, delta w dot x1 equals y1 minus w0 dot x1, okay? And the important thing here is this quantity here, x1 dot x1, um, so this equals uh, sum on i of xi squared, and that's proportional to n, okay? So if you have one training example, the change in the weights so that means delta W, that implies delta WI is proportional to one over N, okay? 
So we have originally, the rich, we can write this as um, initial weight W0i um, So initial weights, W zero I is portion of one over root N. The change in weight is one over N. So the change in weight is really small compared to the initial weight, okay? So, so let's write this here, kind of running out of room. So change in the weights. is small compared to initial weight. Okay. So in some sense, in sort of hindsight, that's obvious, right? We had W dot X, we have, this is a big sum with N parameters. None of them has to change very much to have a big effect on Y, okay? If we have N terms in this sum, we only need each one to change by one over n if it changes in the right direction. Um, and then it gives a big change in y. Okay. So two important things we've learned. One is um, train well, we only need the number of training examples to be large compared to the effective dimension, which is going to come up a little later. And the other one is that if we train in high dimensional systems, the weights don't have to change very much. Okay, so this is with one example. You can work it out with multiple examples. You get the same, um, generally get the same thing. There are cases where things go wrong. Okay. Okay, so that was all linear regression. What about deep networks? Okay, let's go back to our favorite deep network. Um, y equals some function of w dot x. And we always train these networks. So we start off at W naught plus delta W comma X, okay? And this is approximately equal to F of W naught dot X. We have Taylor expand. It's one of my favorite thing to do in the world, delta W dot partial of F of W naught comma X with respect to W. Now, so basically there are higher order terms. We're gonna drop the higher order terms. Okay. Um, so we can write this as Y minus F of W naught X equals Delta W dot, I'm gonna give this a name. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it it's a vector phi and it depends on x. Okay. Dot phi of x. I'm going to give this, okay. So this is now linear regression. Um, also known as a uh, neural tangent kernel for kind of dumb reasons, actually. Often just abbreviated NTK. So these were very popular a few years ago, less so now. Um, but the fact that linear regression is super nice, okay? And that's valid whenever you have a lot of weights, okay? Because um, delta, we can, okay, so um, let's think about the brain. So here's, so let's take a side thing and look at the brain, the brain. Okay, so delta W dot phi of X equals the sum on IJ delta W i j phi i j of x. So i, this is um, presynaptic. Well, so these are 
these are the weights that we've always written down when we wrote down a network equation. And there are humans 10 to the 14th terms in the sum. Okay. And even in, in flies, they're 10 to the ninth. There are a billion terms. Okay. So the weights don't have to change very much to have a really, really big effect. Right. So if every weight in your brain changed by a little bit, that would be a million times a little bit change in the in sort of in the output. Okay, it's a bit mind boggling. It's probably why we can learn it all. So we have to think of learning as slow. In fact, learning is very fast. I mean, you remember things that, that hopefully you remember some of this lecture. You probably remember what you had for breakfast, you know, conversations you had. And those were all due to small changes in a lot of weights. Okay. So this, you know, linear regression may not be very powerful, but if enough weights, it really can be, okay? And so the brain, so this may be, so this may be, in fact, I think it is. Um, a highly relevant regime for the brain. So it's kind of nice. Everything is now linear, okay? And linear regression is something, something we know a lot about, okay? And so what I'm gonna do now is, is we're gonna sort of consider linear regression, we're gonna train on P examples. I'm gonna ask, you know, what, what do we, what can this tell us about the learning process in general, about the weights and so on? Um, after that, I will probably take a break. So you've probably all done linear regression before, but you generally do it when you have far more training examples than, 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 um, than parameters. We're gonna do it in a regime where you have far more parameters and training examples, to which you get pseudo inverse, um, often you do ridge regression, but I'm gonna consider this, uh, this regime under gradient descent, okay? So here's a setup. So we have y, so remember we have y. So we have training examples. X mu, y mu, mu equals one to P and N equals number of weights. is greater than P. And typically it's actually much greater. Um, so we want to fit a model Y mu, I remember minus F of W naught comma X mu equals Delta W dot phi of X mu, okay? And I'm gonna give this a name that so shows up a lot. This is Y mu tilde. This is the thing we're actually trying to fit, okay? So I wanna minimize loss equals one half, the sum on mu of Y mu tilde minus delta W dot phi of X mu. Okay, and so our update rule is, well, um, we now have too many deltas. So update rule, update on trial T on our trial T or presentation T, a trial T. So delta W at T, Actually, say C plus one to make things a little easier. Um, equals delta W of T 
minus eta partial of L with respect to delta W equals delta W at T minus eta sum on mu of delta W dot phi of X mu minus Y mu tilde times phi of X mu. Okay. So the really nice thing about doing linear regression in the over-parameterized regime is you know you can fit the data perfectly, fit your training data perfectly. Um, usually considered a bad idea, but but as long as, as P is affected, P is greater than affected dimensionality, we're sort of assured that that's gonna work. Okay. So what that means is, you know, after training, um, Delta W, so Delta W at T goes to infinity, is this gonna be a linear combination, sum on mu of A mu of phi of X mu. Okay. We can fit the data perfectly, so, so that's what we're gonna get. Um, so I'm gonna actually write that again on the next page. Um, so delta W, I'm gonna drop the T goes infinity. This is a delta W final equals a sum on mu of A mu um, phi of X mu. The linear regression, regression in the over-parameterized regime The premise regime is easy, right? But linear regression, um, actually we're going, linear regression is sort of something you want to add. So using gradient descent, Is easy. So normally, when we run gradient descent, right, we have to solve all these equations. We have to run this update over and over again. If we know we're going to converge, then we know we end up um, here. Okay. It really kind of simplifies our life. Now we have to find the A mu's. So remember, um, what we're fitting is um, so y nu y mu tilde equals um, delta w dot phi of x mu and delta w, we're gonna write this sum on nu, sum on nu of a nu phi of x nu dot phi of x mu, okay? So I'm gonna define this to be c nu mu. And of course it's symmetric, so a symmetric matrix. Boy, handwriting is going downhill. So what this means is that um, y mu, y mu equals the sum on nu of c mu nu a nu, which we can now invert and we write a mu So a mu equals um, the sum on nu of c mu nu inverse y nu tilde. Okay. And if you look up here, that just means that delta w equals 
uh, the sum on mu of a mu, which is the sum on nu of c mu nu inverse. Um, I actually write it like this. Uh, so phi of x nu, c nu mu inverse y tilde mu. Okay. Um, and finally, what we have then, so this is delta w, right? So we have, um, so now we get sort of our, our thing that I really care about. Um, so y minus f of w naught comma x is equal to delta w dot phi of x equals sum on mu nu. So we have phi of x dot phi of x nu times c nu mu inverse y nu tilde. So I'm going to write out what y nu tilde is. Um, y minus f of w naught x nu. Okay. So this is after we fit our functions, after we find all the parameters, this is y evaluated on a, on a new, new point x. And so we're going to write that. So our, after we fit our model, so y equals f of w zero comma x. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna define something first. So I'm gonna make a definition. A definition. So remember phi of x dot phi of x prime equals partial of f of w naught comma x with respect to w naught dot partial of f, this is dot product of w naught comma x prime with respect to w naught. I'm going to define this to be a kernel between x and x prime. Okay. It's curl function. This is why this is called neural tangent kernel. So, with that definition, we have, after we fit our model, so y equals f of w naught comma x plus the sum on mu comma nu k of x comma x mu k inverse of x mu comma x nu and the inverse is respect to the indices x nu and x mu and then y nu minus f of w naught x mu x new, okay? Okay, this is a super important result because it tells us, at least in this regime, a regime that may be linear to the, uh, relevant to the brain, exactly what's going on. Okay, so the first observation, so observe it. So, so if one, if x equals x alpha, this is part of the training set. Okay, then y equals f of w naught comma x alpha plus the sum on mu comma nu 
mu comma nu k of x alpha comma x mu k inverse of x mu comma x nu times y nu minus f of w naught x x nu. So by the way, let's be clear about what, what this inverse means, okay? Oops, did I erase something? Yes, I did. Okay. So the inverse, what the inverse means is that sum on a new of K inverse of X mu comma X nu times K of X nu X beta um, equals delta alpha beta, sorry, better beta there. So this equals delta mu beta equals one, mu equals beta, and zero mu is not equal to beta. So it's just a standard old matrix, okay? And we see here, we're summing on mu, right? So this is K, this is true, this is K inverse K. Uh, K, K inverse gives the same thing. So this says alpha must equal to nu. Um, so this term here, so this equals, same thing here, plus um, alpha has to equal to mu, it's sum on mu of delta alpha mu, y, uh, delta alpha, sorry. Delta alpha nu, y nu minus f of w naught x mu nu. And of course, I'm um, sorry, someone new. And what this means is this equals F of W naught comma X alpha plus Y alpha minus F of W naught X alpha equals Y alpha. So this is what we expect, right? When we plug in, we fit all the training data perfectly. So when we plug in X alpha, we get y back, okay? So what that means is, um, so if, if this is our, this, say the uh, spy lives in 2D, um, so these are, you know, this is x1, x2, x3, um, so this is actually this is actually phi space, phi of x space. So we fit perfectly here. So we fit perfectly. Fit training data perfectly. Okay, and you know we in here, so we fit okay. Okay, if data points are not are not too far apart. Okay. Okay. And so this is why we need low D. This is why we need the data to live in, in low dimensions. Okay. Um, in high D, data points tend to be far apart, right? Um, so 
if you want, so if you want these points close together, they better live in the low, low dimensional manifold. Okay, I think that should kind of make sense. Um, so a simple example, let me see. This is our last slide, then we have to give up. So a simple example, if you have data points in 1D and 2D, right? So in 2D points are far apart. In 2D, if you project down to 1D, right? Points are a lot closer together. in 1D, okay? So this is really important, right? So we did a bunch of analysis and we got this equation that really tells us that, um, that you're, you're, this deep network is really just interpolating. Okay, it's fitting data and in between, if points are close enough, it's gonna fit as well. The other thing is if you have a new data point where this term is small, you're just basically back to your old original network and you're complete noise, okay? So in this view, deep networks do not generalize. They interpolate and they cannot extrapolate beyond the data they see. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there, take a five minute break. As usual, hang around if there are any questions. Um, And then we will continue with um, sort of relevant facts about, about deep networks. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. I'm sure why my video got turned off.
Okay, so let's start up again. Um, I need to, unfortunately, yep. Do not know why. Okay. Complain about that every time. Stop, share, share, start over. Okay, so I want to actually um, sort of be totally clear on the implications of this. So, so why, remember we have y after fitting equals f of w0 comma x. I'm gonna write it like this, minus, um, the sum on mu, I'll write it like this, mu k of x comma x mu, k inverse of x mu comma x nu times y, y nu minus f of w naught x nu. Okay. So if you have new data, so that, so, get new data. This is not in your training example. Okay, so new data, not your training example. Um, and, A K of, let's, let's call it X new, new data. So X new, K of X new, um, X mu is small. Mu, that implies that y is approximately equal to f of w naught x mu, okay? Basically, this term is small, so this term just goes away. So that means, so this is good and bad. So the bad, can't generalize, but the good, is um, data sets don't really in it. So, so good is you can, so what's happened, right? Good is you've, you've trained um, So you trained on one data set. And that didn't affect the other. Implies tasks don't interfere. So basically, the tasks don't interfere um, if kernel is small. So basically, so let's say x uh, mu comes from task one, task one, x mu prime comes from task two, then if K of X mu comma X prime um, is approximately equal to zero for all U and U prime, then there's no interference. No interference. No interference, right? You can train on one task and train on the other task and not have to worry, right? 
this is a really, really important feature for any network to have. It's something that humans are and other animals are incredibly good at. You know, you can learn to play ride a bike, you can learn to play football, you can learn to play the cello, you can learn, and they just don't really, you know, it's not like after you learn to ride a bike, you go learn to play the cello, you can't ride the bike anymore. No effect whatsoever. You can learn multiple languages and they don't, they interfere a little bit, but surprisingly hardly at all. And they use more or less the same part of your brain. Although they may be slightly localized, right? But certainly motor tasks, you can learn lots and lots of motor tasks and they simply don't interfere. So, so this, this sort of non-generalization is, is, you kind of want to generalize where you want to generalize. But my view is that networks actually, deep networks actually never generalize. At least the ones in the brain where this, this um, regime may be valid. Okay, so um, I'm gonna say one more thing about the brain before we go on. Um, and that is actually, so this is, is one nice feature. So one nice feature is, is this no interference. You can learn multiple tasks without, and if the kernels are small between the two tasks, uh, it's okay. You don't, you, don't lose, you don't lose much. So there's also another kind of thing that's nice about this. Um, so we have, remember, delta W. Um, so, Let's, let's write it down. So remember our model. So y equals f of w naught comma x plus the sum on ij of delta w. I'm gonna be very explicit about this ij partial of f of w naught comma x with respect to wij. And as we saw earlier, so the brain, humans, so humans, 10 to the 14th terms in the sum. And we saw earlier that, that that means, so that would imply that delta Wij portion of one over 10 to the 14th, okay? So very, very tiny changes in, in, in weights can have a huge effect. Now this can't be right. It's just too small. You said I don't think it's right. Um, presumably what happens, this is too small, but what probably happens happens is that learning is localized. Okay, so maybe on the order of, you know, 10 to the six synapses change at once. So 10 to the six would be number of connections between, you know, groups of a thousand neurons, um, they're fully connected. So that's not so big, all right? So in this case, Delta Wij, portion of, you know, one over 10 to six, okay? And this is pretty small, so it's kind of nice. You can make small changes in synaptic weights. Um, if we have a good learning role, that can be done. And the nice thing about this is it's so it's very tolerant to random weight changes. Okay. So if delta wij, if you have, so if you have uh, delta, so random weight changes, so the sum on ij of delta wij random, um, times partial of f respect to wij, 
is proportional to square root of n number that changes um, times the size of the weight. Times size of the weight. Okay, that means you can tolerate weight changes of size epsilon over the square root of n, okay? And that's very different from, from this thing, right? Which um, this is one over n. Okay, so if n is a million, take an example. So n equals 10 to the six, um, you might have, you know, structured correct weight changes proportional one over 10 to the six, random, Portion, let's say 0 0.1 over 10 to the third, right? Um, so basically epsilon is 0 0.1. Oops. So you said epsilon is 0 0.1. Okay. So even though, is up here? So even though this, this is actually, these, these weight changes here are actually 10 times bigger than the ones here, they have almost no effect, a 10% effect, okay? Um, so this is really nice, right? The fact that the weight change, structured weight changes, the correct weight changes scales one over n, random ones don't have much, have much smaller effects, um, means, you, you can afford lots of random weight changes. And the reason that's important is because that's what you observe in the brain. If you stick an electrode in the brain, you'll see, um, you'll see drift in synaptic strengths. Okay, and they're, they're pretty big. Um, presumably they're in a random direction and, and don't hurt things very much because you know, you wake up next, you know, day to day, even though your weight change, weight's changed by a lot, there's not a big change in, in what you know in your personality. Okay. So this regime in which you have a lot of weights and they don't change by very much is incredibly useful. Um, okay, so I want to talk about, so we have about 15 minutes left, 20, 25 minutes left. I want to talk about two things. One is, um, these relate a little more to biology. Well, one is one relates more to biology. One is um, so so learning in deep networks uses backdrop. Okay, and I want to be completely clear that how completely non-biologically -bio possible that is. So remember our network looks like this. Okay, in between we have weights, oops. Okay, and this is layer L. So the forward propagation of information Propagation of information of information is X in layer L. So this is so this would be layer L is equal to some nonlinearity applied to. Um, I'm going to use matrices now, WL dot X 
L minus one. Okay. You know, so we start with some input X over here, it goes to the first layer, it goes to the second layer, it goes to the third layer, it goes to the fourth layer, it goes all the way through. So after we go all the way through on a forward pass, so this is this is the forward pass. Okay, then we learn. Okay, learning is sort of two steps. We back propagate the error signal, delta L equals, make sure I write down the right learning signal, um, phi prime of H L, I forget L or L plus one. Doesn't matter, W transpose, the transpose of the weight of weight L plus one, transpose um, dot delta in layer L plus one. Okay. And the actual update rule, rule is delta W in layer L is equal to delta L X. I believe it's XL, it could be XL minus one, it doesn't really matter. But the point is in the learning phase, so we have to propagate the information forward. The information has to stay in these neurons as we propagate it back, okay? So two things, information stays in the neurons as we propagate it back, and we need to know the transpose of the weights, okay? So delta L, so delta L lives in here, so our learning signal lives in here. Um, and the weights So the weights are W L plus one transpose. So these are the outgoing weights. And neurons don't know they're outgoing weights. This must be L minus one. Okay. Um, half a billion years of evolution, they don't know outgoing weights. It's reason for that. So, so basically, um, so backprop is not biologically possible. Okay. And there's been a huge effort over the last decade to make it, to come up with schemes that are biologically possible. Um, so the earliest one was kind of cool. So, and it made a big splash. So I'm gonna say a few words about how we make these biologically possible. Um, so how do we learn? Okay. By the way, the next two lectures, I'm gonna talk about real life synaptic plasticity and you'll see how local it is. Um, so an early effort was kind of interesting. An early effort is replaced. So if you look back to this, this um, update rule, it requires that you use the, the transpose of the weights. Oh man. So this was W, okay. So use a transpose of the weights. And they're really outgoing weights. Okay. So an early effort was to replace uh, replace um, W L plus one transpose by B L plus one random. Okay. 
So why not? I mean, why is really the question, but so it works surprisingly well. Well, on simple problems. So mainly it's something called MNIST. I don't know if you've heard of it, MNIST, which is a handwriting, um, Actually, it's digits. It's the handwriting recognition. Uh, recognition. Okay, it's actually digits. So digits. Oh, zero three nine. So these are handwritten digits. Um, this was really big when I was in my youth. Um, a lot of work was put into this because um, basically the post office wanted to automate this, and it turns out that. Everything works on MNIST. MNIST is just so easy that no matter what neural network you throw at it, it works really well. Um, so um, this method, which is called um, is called feedback alignment. So this is called feedback alignment. Doesn't work on hard problems. So there, there are data sets with thousands of images, thousands of different categories, and, and those are the benchmarks for today. So it just doesn't work. So random feedback was, you know, a good thing to try. It didn't work at all. And since then, there's been just a huge. I will actually, um, I'll put something online with a bunch of references. So this is a huge um, research effort. And plausible learning rules. And it's been, I'd say, pretty successful. We now have lots and lots of candidate learning rules. Um, I'm not sure that's how you spell successful. I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, we now have lots and lots of candidate learning success. So lots of candidate learning roles. That are Okay, um, and so that's kind of nice. So, so one of the original objections to deep learning was that it just backprop cannot be used by the brain. And I think we don't know which one, if any of these the brain uses, but we know that it has a lot of possibilities. Um, and I'll put something online, uh, recent work actually by me and some colleagues and it's, and then it has lots and lots of references which you can, which I'll, I'll send you to. Okay, for the last few minutes, I want to talk about unsupervised learning. Okay. So what, so we've talked about supervised learning. Um, you don't really get much supervised learning in your life, right? So, I mean, you can, um, I mean, it's not in some sense, not, technically nothing supervised in the brain, all you get are spikes, but you can imagine the way things are set up, people tells you something. So you might, you might see a picture like this. Okay, and there's you know, a house in it. Or a window. You can tell what a bad artist I am. It's got a tree, it's got a sun. So picture drawn by four-year-old. Um, and you can recognize this is a house and this is a tree and this is a sun. And, and that's because somebody at some point told you in your life, you know, this is a house, this is a sun. 
But the unsupervised learning signal, so amount of information you get from a supervised signal, and even that's in quotes, right? Because um, you're not really, um, in some sense, it's all spiked, is at most, let's be super generous, one bit per second. Okay? So the reason that's relevant is because you have 10 to the 14 synapses. Okay. So to, to provide one bit of synapse, one bit of information, to each synapse, would take 10 to 14 seconds um, three times 10 to the seconds in the year so equals three million years and that would be fine if we live to be three million but we don't we live to be you know sort of on the order of 100. So most information coming into the brain is unsupervised. Okay. And by the way, one bit per second is it's hugely much larger than you get. It's probably more like a tenth of a bit per second, which means 30 million years, but it doesn't really matter, okay? So although people may not tell you, you know, this is a sun, this is a tree, this is a shoe, this is a cow, you see a lot of images in your life. Uh, you make a saccade, you move your eyes about three times a second. So, you know, that's on the order of, you know, one image per second. And each image can contain millions of bits, okay? Um, so unsupervised learning is really the most important aspect of learning in the brain. Um, and it's a lot harder than supervised learning, okay? In some sense, so unsupervised learning is really, it's un unsupervised learning learning, um, you know, means learning from data with no labels okay it's basically clustering but very sophisticated clustering okay um so, you know, if you very abstractly, you have some 2D data, right? So you're just observing data points. They could be completely abstract. Um, and, you know, you saw like, you know, a lot of your data lives over here, a lot of it lives over there. I don't have to tell you anything to, for you to realize these data maybe came from some sort of something that, that's very different, okay? Um, and, you know, if, if cats and in some space, these might end up being cats, and these might end up being dogs, okay? So you did the hard work of figuring out that these are different, and then somebody comes in and says, that's a cat, that's a dog, and you're done, okay? And that's more or less what happens. You see lots of images, you can see, realize that, you know, if, if you see something sort of bright in the sky, it's, there's only sort of one thing that can be bright in the sky, so you cluster that, right? This is versus things that are on the ground, which have, you know, leaves and, and branches, things that, that have doors and windows. And you, without knowing the names, you can cluster those in your brain, okay? Um, but this idea of clustering is, 
is actually conceptually what's going on, but it's really hard to turn it into a theory. And the problem is that, um, you know, so in this case, um, I wrote, you know, these, these uh, um, two clusters were obviously separated. So if you look in pixel space, so this was in, this is in some post-process, post-process space. So if you look in pixel space, so the actual decision boundaries between cats and dogs may be very complicated, okay? So we have on one side, we have cats, And so dots, you know, all these dots are, are correspond to cats. Each dot is a different cat. And then the other side, you have dogs. Okay. And so it's very hard, you know, to build a clustering algorithm that could find these clusters, right? Which is why we have deep networks in the first place. These have very, very complicated boundaries. Okay. So the modern approach to unsupervised learning build a latent variable model. So basically, so you have data, so you have data X is X. So for example, images. So explain the data the latent variable. We write that as p of x. I can do a sum, it could be a sum, it could be an integral. Let's do sum. Sum on z of p of x given z, p of z. And so you want to parameterize this with some set of parameters. Okay. So this data is observed. You want to basically build some parametric model that explains the data really well. Um, and so, for instance, if you know, if, if your data, and, and you, the thing is, you don't observe the z's, they're completely unobserved, you observe only the x's. So, if for instance, you know, let's say this x was 1d, this is p of x, it looked like this. You might say, okay, so this is p of x, you might say, okay, we're going to assume that p of, um, of x given z. Is Gaussian. So, so P of X given Z is Gaussian. And you're going to explain these things with so this is P of X given Z1 and P of X given z2, right? And the parameter is theta. So these are the parameters of a Gaussian. So mean and variance. Okay. And so once you've restricted this conditional distribution to be Gaussians, you can sort of minimize, uh, minimize, um, so what you want to do is so once you have a distribution, actually I'm going to go to the next page. Okay. So the setup should be kind of clear. Okay, data. 
So data, P of X, um, parameterize it. Parameterize P of X with sum on Z, P of X given Z, P of Z, and these are thetas. And so this is, you know, some, some nice class, at least in the in original, when people did this, it was a nice class, and then choose theta to maximize um, log um, p theta of x, where basically this is p theta of x. Um, log um, sum over uh, x in data set. Okay. So you have a bunch of samples, you know, so you basically compute this quantity. Um, you have to make decisions about, you know, how many z's to choose and how to parameterize the z's and so on. But once you have something to maximize, then you can run gradient descent. Okay. So maximize, we should be very happy because we can maximize with gradient descents, okay? You know, exactly how to maximize that is non-trivial, but there are ways. And so in the modern approach, so basically I used parameterize Um, P theta of X given Z with a deep network. Okay. So now you don't have, here you sort of had to use something in the old days, you had to use something, some known class like a Gaussian. Now you can use a deep network. And now you can make very, very powerful generative models. And, and so this is a field that was, you know, 10 years ago, so a, a, one complaint about deep networks was, you know, they can't do unsupervised learning, and now they can, okay. So I am gonna give you a couple of references to this. Um, it's a huge, huge field. I think at this point, you should just know it exists if you ever need it. You know, supervised learning is now, it's still harder than, unsupervised learning is now possible. It's still much harder than supervised learning, um, but now deep networks can do unsupervised learning, okay. Okay, I'm gonna actually, so. Okay, so I'm gonna stop now. Um, again, as usual, I'll stay on for about five minutes and then all this stuff will go up on the website. Um, if you have any questions in the next five minutes, I'll be here.
Okay, uh, see if anybody's left, I'll see you on, oops, nobody's left. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>